Okay, everybody, this is Wilkins, Chapter 23, Indices and Scoring Methods. Uh, you are going to be having an entire semester in public health, and we'll be talking about these indices and scoring methods for more of a community basis versus an individual patient base basis. Uh, so this chapter is really an overview of what is used out there by both clinicians as well as community practitioners and researchers, and they uh, evaluate indicators of oral health status. So we're not going to be able to go into great depth here, lucky for you, uh, but do be familiar with the terminology on box 23-1. Uh, that will allow you to uh, navigate much better. So the learning objectives, we're going to identify key terms, identify the purpose and criteria for the measurement and scoring method, as well as select and calculate dental indices. And I'm not really going to be uh, delving into the specific calculations, but we will be getting into about how they're calculated. So there are different types of scoring methods and um, indices that are used in clinical practice as well as by community programs to determine and record the oral health status of individuals or groups, as we said. So for an individual assessment score um, in clinical practice, it's an index, like a biofilm record or a scoring system for an individual patient that can be used for education, motivation, as well as evaluation. And the effects of personal disease control efforts, their, um, their oral hygiene efforts, and the pro progress of um, healing between uh, appointments as well as the maintenance of health over time can be monitored. So an example of that is the biofilm free score, in which a patient's able to measure the effects of personal daily care efforts by the changes in the scores. So this provides an individual assessment to help a patient recognize an oral problem as well as reveal the degree of effectiveness of the presence um, of their oral hygiene practices. Is it working or is it not working? So that will help hopefully motivate the patient during preventive and professional care uh, for the elimination and control of oral disease. You want to get them to buy into what you're doing and why. And it will help you evaluate the success of individual and uh, your treatment as well over a period of time to see what's working and what's not working by comparing the index scores. So for clinical trials, the purpose is uh, really to plan um, the effect of an agent or a procedure on the prevention, progression, or control of disease. So the trial is conducted by comparing an experimental group with a control group that's similar to the experimental group in every way except for the variable being studied. So an example of that could be used uh, like the plaque index and the patient hygiene performance, um, PHP. So to determine the baseline data before ex uh, experimental factors are introduced, you want to measure the effectiveness as well of specific agents of prevention, control, or treatment of oral conditions. Did they work? Did they not work? If so, how effective were they? And um, to measure all of that. Then you can also use this as a epidemiological survey. So it's individual, clinical, and epidemiological. Uh, the world epidemiology denotes the study of diseases um, characteristic of populations rather than individuals. So an epidemiologic survey provides information on the trends and patterns of oral health and disease within a population. So an example of that might be the DMFT, decayed, missing, and filled teeth, to determine the extent of dental caries. Um, the uses, you can determine the prevalence and incidence of a particular condition uh, within a given population. It provides baseline data on indicators to show existing dental health status within a population. And the Surgeon General's report on oral health in America uses the epidemiologic data to identify oral health disparities in certain populations. It's also used to provide data to support recommendations for public health interventions 
um, to improve the health status of populations, such as those provided in the United States Healthy People 2020 document. For community surveillance, uh, the community surveillance of oral health indicators and uh, determinants can be accomplished really on many levels. The governmental agencies, local community-based services providing agencies, professional associations are examples of groups that collect data to determine oral health status by conducting oral health screenings and information on community-wide oral uh, screenings that can be used. So an example of that might be community-based uh, group of the Association of State and Territorial Dental Directors, where uh, it's the basic screening survey, the ASTDDBSS. You don't need to remember that. Uh, but it uses it to assess the needs of a community and to help plan community-based health promotion and disease prevention programs, as well as to compare the effects and evaluate the results of that program. So what is an index? An index is a way of expressing of clinical observations by using numbers. So the use of numbers can provide standardization um, to make observations of a health condition consistent and less subjective than a word description of that same condition. We have descriptive categories of indices. We've got general categories. Um, general can be simple or cumulative. The simple index measures the presence or absence of a condition. So an example of that could be dental biofilm without evaluating the effect of the gingiva. Is it there or is it not there? A cumulative index, though, measures all the evidence of a condition, past and present. So an example of that could be the DMFT index, the De uh, Decayed Missing Filled Teeth Index for dental caries. And there are types of simple and cumulative indices, reversible and irreversible. And irreversible measures conditions that will not change, such as dental caries. Dental caries is not going to go away once you have it. Reversible, though, measures conditions that can be changed, and that could be dental biofilm. That index will go down if oral hygiene changes. So there's a selection criteria, and it needs to be, uh, uh, to be a useful and effective index. There are certain criteria that need to be met. So it needs to be simple to use and calculate. Uh, there needs to be minimal equipment and expense needed. It needs to be fast and easy, uh, no patient discomfort. It has to have clear-cut criteria that are readily understandable by everybody who's doing it. Um, it needs to be as free as possible from subjective interpretation. And it needs to be reproducible by the same examiner or by different examiners, as well as be amenable to statistical analysis. So it has to have validity as well as reliability. So in the clinical setting, uh, we use these indices that measure oral hygiene status um, to help educate and motivate the individual patient. So when data is collected in a community setting, though, such as a nursing home, the findings can help determine how daily oral care is being provided and monitor the results of uh, the education program itself. So let's get into some of the um, indices. We've got the biofilm index, which used to be called historically the plaque index, PL for plaque I index. And this is to assess the thickness of biofilm in the gingival area. So this is um, strictly a uh, biofilm score. Is it there or isn't on the cervical or gingival area? So the entire dentition or selected teeth can be, um, can be examined. You want to dry the teeth off. So it can be um, all the mouth or modified with just certain teeth or surfaces and you evaluate dental biofilm on the cervical third, you're not paying any attention to the biofilm that might be in the middle or the incisal thirds. You're only concerned about the cervical thirds. And a probe is used to test the surface when no biofilm 
is visible, but you're just passing the probe or the explorer around the cervical third. Is it there or is it not there? And if it's not there, you have a score of zero, and it goes up to a score of three. So um, the plaque index is used in conjunction also with the gingival index. Is there plaque there? If there is, is there bleeding there as well? So um, when biofilm, again, a zero means there's nothing, a one means there's something, right? For biofilm index, it can go up to a three, a, a zero is none, a one is just a film adhering, a two is moderate, and three is a bunch of stuff, right? So you want to basically know um, how to interpret these findings. The lower the number, the better. Now there's a biofilm control record. Usually these are um, six areas. And you apply a disclosing agent. And this is something that you're going to be doing for your patients. And you examine each tooth surface to see if there's dental biofilm. And then you're coloring in or you're marking down each surface. And then you're doing a calculation, how many surfaces, uh, how many teeth times four or six, how many surfaces were you looking at. Um, you multiply that. So for example, 26 teeth were scored. There were eight surfaces with biofilm. Then you multiply the number of teeth by four or six. How many surfaces did you look at? And you come up with a percentage that way. So we would love to see a percentage of zero, meaning that you had no biofilm at all. But that is really unrealistic. So the guideline is less than 10% of biofilm stain surfaces is really um, suggested by science as a guideline in periodontal health. So after initial therapy, when the patients reached a 10% level of biofilm or better, then oftentimes the patient is ready to proceed with other surgical interventions um, because they have a handle on their oral hygiene. So the lower the number, the better. So if my plaque index score was, or a biofilm control record score was 90%, that meant that 90% of my surfaces had biofilm on them. And I only had 10% that were biofilm free. You, again, motivate the patient by saying our goal is to decrease that each time you come in to hopefully get you below 10% or less, which means you've got a handle on everything. And this is the O'Leary Biofilm Control Record or plaque index. And this is what we use in clinic. Uh, we don't have the schematic on Dentrix. For some reason, we can't put the schematic. So this is with the FDI system as well as um, the universal, depending on um, if it's a worldwide system being used. So you can see the two numbers going on there. Uh, and you do the total number of tooth parts with biofilm divided by four times or six times the number of teeth uh, present. OK, that gives you the total number. And you multiply that by 100 to come up with a percent. So again, we're looking for a small percent, which means the patient's doing an adequate job. Now, the biofilm free score or the plaque free score is the opposite. How many surfaces are biofilm free? So for this, um, you want to see a high number. So this is opposite. After you use disclosing solution, you're going around, and uh, then you're coming up with a score. So the percentage of biofilm free surfaces, if they had no biofilm whatsoever, it would be 100%. Again, unrealistic. So if we're looking for 10% for a plaque index or biofilm score, we are looking for a 90% of a biofilm free score. So you have to know, again, what uh, indice you're trying to talk to your patient about. So this is just one of the schematics that can be used for that. Then we've got patient hygiene performance, PHP. Okay, and that is to assess the extent of biofilm and debris over a tooth surface. Uh, you can use um, 
if you're using specific teeth and specific surfaces within that. So again, a good is zero, a fair or poor, depending on how much of the tooth surface is being covered, and the number. So you assign a zero to five, and the higher the number, the more biofilm is on that tooth. Now there's also the simplified OHI, Oral Hygiene Index Simplified, which uses six teeth, facial and lingual. The facial on the maxillary and the lingual on the mandibular molars, for example. Uh, very specific teeth, the same teeth on each person, the same surface on each person. This identifies six specific teeth. So you're looking at the extent, either on the facial or lingual, of the tooth that's being selected. And you're coming up with a score of zero. There's no debris or stain of one. Soft debris covering not more than one third of the tooth. Two covering uh, more than a third, but not more than two thirds. And three covering pretty much all of the tooth. So with zero, one, two, and three. And the same thing can be done for the calculus index. Now the calculus index um, uses specific teeth. This is the OHIS, 0, 1, 2, and 3. The calculus index does pretty much the same thing on the same teeth. A 0 is no calculus. A 1 is the cervical area. A 2, half the tooth, and it's starting to go subgingibly. And 3 is pretty much the whole tooth as well as subgingival. So again, the lower the number, the better. So we've got um, indices as well for gingival and periodontal health. The papillary marginal attached index is one of them. Uh, the PI, the periodontal index, not to be confused with the PL for the plaque index, is, um, is another one. And they've been modified over the years. Um, bleeding on gentle probing or flossing is an early sign of gingival inflammation. And oftentimes, that will be the first sign of disease uh, before color changes and enlargement of the gingival tissues. So we're looking at the bleeding index for that. Now, there's something called the PSR, which um, the American Dental Association was recommending in the 80s and 90s that every office do uh, on each and every patient. The uh, malpractice that uh, was being brought to the courts tended to be concentrated on the lack of diagnosing periodontal disease. So this came out of the World Health Organization, out of a community screening and an epidemiological study. The American Dental Association and AAP refined it to come up with the periodontal screening and reporting. And this is to assess the state of periodontal health in individuals. And again, it was uh, modified from the uh, World Health Organization. The idea is that each sextant of a mouth is being scored, and each sextant only has one score of 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Again, a 0 is healthy, no problem. If that sextant has a, a 0 in it or a 1, that means that there has been no attachment loss, so the, that particular patient doesn't need further evaluation as far as more extensive periodontal evaluation for that particular area of the tooth. But if the patient came up with a score of a four, there was attachment loss, then that sextant needed to be evaluated more thoroughly. And they had a special probe with a little ball at the end uh, that had a, um, here's the PSR probe. And um, it, the black band was from 3.5 to 5.5. So when you placed the probe subgingively, if none of the black was covered, that meant you had a, a, a 1, 2, or a 3 millimeter sulcus. And you just went on your way. So a code 1 means that uh, part of the black was 
being covered with the gingiva, right? And the CEJ is within the black band of the probe, so that meant the probing depth was 3.5 to 5.5. Code 2, the entire black band was covered, 6 to 8 millimeter pocket there compared to the CEJ. Code 3 was 9 to 11 millimeters of loss, and a code 4 is 12 millimeters or greater. So uh, code 0 or 1, as long as the whole black wasn't being covered up, was still considered pretty good. Again, this was a screening to allow you to determine if that patient required more further investigation. Then there was a community periodontal index, um, the CPI, and I think I'm all CPI, there you go. It was originally developed as a epidemiological survey from the uh, World Health Organization, and this is what later became the PSR. Then there's the sulcus bleeding index as well. And that's when you're taking a uh, periodontal probe and you're just walking the probe around the base, holding it parallel with the long axis of the tooth. You're waiting 30 seconds. You're just going around the gingival margin. You're waiting 30 seconds. And then you're going back to see if there was any bleeding. Again, a code of zero means there was healthy, there was no bleeding, versus uh, a one, two, or three. So uh, that is scored. Gingival bleeding index. Then the Eastman interdental bleeding index is another one that's very easy to use. This is a stimulant, and it's a triangular piece of balsa wood that is an interdental cleaner. So you take the stimulant, you lightly press it against the gingiva, and you feed it in and out of the embrasure space. Uh, three or four times. Well, let me see if I can. Because there, there is a specific way to do that. So you depress the papilla one to two millimeters. Uh, you hold that uh, stimulant horizontal or parallel to the occlusal surface, and you move it in and out four times. Excuse me, four times, and then you wait 15 seconds to see if there's any bleeding. So again. 0, 1, 2, or 3 um, is being assigned there. How much bleeding? How fast did it occur? Gingival index to assess the severity of gingivitis based on color, consistency, and bleeding on probing. So again, you're taking a probe and you're just going along the gingival margin. You're not doing a probe reading per se and you're trying to come up with a code of zero, normal, no, no inflammation was noted, to a one, two, or three for mild, moderate, or severe inflammation for that. Then there is dental caries. Now, dental caries is, um, the dental caries experience data is most useful when measuring the prevalence of dental disease in groups rather than individuals. The population score can document such information as if the number of persons in any age group that's affected by dental caries, the number of teeth that need treatment, or the proportion of teeth that have been treated. So we've got things for permanent dentition. Permanent dentition is DMFT or DMFS for decayed, missing, and filled teeth. They are used in uppercase or capital letters and they determine the total dental caries experience, past and present, by recording uh, either the number of affected teeth or tooth surfaces. So the DMFT is based on 28 teeth versus the DMFS is based on the surfaces. So 28 teeth, you have 128 surfaces, that type of thing. Um, the teeth that aren't counted are the third molars or unerupted teeth. Now, for primary teeth, decayed, missing, filled, et cetera, is used with lowercase letters, right? DF, decayed, filled, um, or extracted. So that is the DEF or DF. 
Then you also have for primary dentition, DMFT, DMFS, again, with lower case. Early childhood caries, ECC, is um, another one that we're not going to get into, but it is uh, used to be called baby bottle caries, so there is an index for that. Now, root surface caries, root caries index, RCI. Are you noticing a trend that these letters mean something? Um, we don't need to go into how this is calculated, but do know that there is a specific one for root caries as well. Dental fluorosis from the fluoride chapter, you know that there are fluorosis indexes. Dean's fluorosis index, right, as well as the tooth surface index of fluorosis. So those are two. You've got community-based oral health surveillance that determine the population access to or the need for oral health services. We have the World Health Organization has things out there as well. And this is another one which we're not going to get into. Again, it's more for the World Health Organization. And again, when you do an index, you are going to name the index, you are going to give the score and an objective statement, and follow up instructions. What are you going to do about it? Did you uh, refine the patient's brushing technique if they were missing the cervical third? You know, that all goes with the documentation, not just the index itself. So we want to show our patients and inform our patient what we're doing and the importance of what we're doing because we're looking in the mouth, we're putting something on paper or in the computer, we're looking in the mouth and we keep going back and forth and back and forth. So if we let the patient know what we're doing, uh, they know that you'll be talking to them about it when they're done. And we want a correlation of their index scores with current oral health practices and procedures and then we're going to follow up with them and compare these indexes from one visit to another. So for the O'Leary plaque score or biofilm score, if they come in with a score of 76%, that means 76% of the surfaces, their tooth surfaces in their mouth had biofilm on it. You uh, let them know that, you know, that meant only 24% had nothing. So we want to try and get this down to a reasonable percent. We'll be checking it each time. We're not going from 76% to a goal of 10% or less in one visit, but you want to make achievable goals with your patient. So it could be, uh, you know, baby steps, but you get the patient involved in that percent uh, so they can see that they're improving. And that is chapter 23.